All right, maybe we should get started. Uh, no. Let me find my script here. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening for a virtual artist talk with Jamie Santos. Uh, my name is Sarah Felice. I'm the director of Point of Contact Gallery at Syracuse University. Uh, I'm gonna start this evening by thanking the College of Arts and Sciences and the Coalition of Museum and Art Centers at Syracuse University who continue to support our programs year after year, which allows us to bring you virtual programming in 2020. I personally believe, uh, you know, we all need more art in our lives to get through these uncertain times. Um, artists are the voices that set the tone of our culture and our society. Um, many of you are my fellow artists and friends. Uh, we're delighted to be back with our partners Adapt CNY's Public Arts Task Force for the sixth installment uh, of the Community Summer Art Show, even if the format is a little bit different this year. Um, you may notice I'm wearing my Public Arts Task Force t-shirt in support of our friends. Um, if you're interested in learning more about PATF and how to get involved, uh, our gallery assistant, Sheridan. Sheridan, say hi. Hello. Okay, is that Sheridan? Um, uh, she's going to be dropping the contact email for PATF in the chat window. Uh, so Sheridan's going to be monitoring the chat window this evening. And if anyone has questions they want to ask Jamie throughout the evening, uh, we can address them at the end. Uh, we just please ask that you type them only in chat and leave your microphone silenced to ensure we can hear her. Um, also, for those of you that may be not as experienced with Zoom, we recommend you switch to speaker view. Uh, that way you can hear her and see a little bit better. Uh, if you go to the upper right hand corner of where the tattoo actually is, uh, you can pin that video. So while she's speaking, you'll be able to watch the tattooing. Take place. I'm just you. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so with that, I want to welcome Jamie Santos. Uh, she's been a tattoo artist since 2003. In addition to her artist talk, she's going to be tattooing Molly live. Um, woo after, woo uh, after moving to Bangor, Maine uh, to learn under Ed Sheffer of Diversified Inc., Santos worked at Scarab Body Arts in Syracuse for seven years while apprenticing artist Sean Morgan and fellow colleague Nick Moore. A summer after running the successful Deck the Halls Civic Art Show at the Salt Quarters during the holiday season, she moved to work with the very talented artists of Timeless Tattoo in Baldwinsville. Beyond tattooing, arts advocacy is her passion. She loves uplifting and bringing people together in civic art shows when possible. She has worked with galleries such as Point of Contact, Salt Porters, the Everson Museum, Apostrophes, the Gear Factory, and as well as businesses such as Beer Belly Deli, Wildflowers Armory, and Kasai Ramen to include local artists for free exposure. The Cathedral Collective, which I'm a part of, uh, encompasses this and is run as an underground CNY local arts collective. Her first passion is art itself. She's an avid drawer, freelance illustrator, portrait artist, painter, and has shown work throughout central New York and as far as Michigan. She's continually working on her portfolio and collection to further herself and art vision. So welcome my friend Jamie. Hi guys. Hi. So thank you for coming to my art talk. Um, so this is the first art talk of the series. Um, so this is kind of like the tester, <laughs> kind of figure things out as we go along. Um, so basically about myself, I've been tattooing for about 15 years. Um, when I first started, I was one of the only female tattoo artists in the area. There were maybe like two other women like within the area itself. And it's, uh, it's always been a very male dominated um, industry. So that itself has its challenges. Um, so you kind of, you know, you try your best. Um, and at first, when tattooing first came along, it wasn't super art centric. Um, it was more, hey, like I copied this from this piece. Uh, we're gonna put it on an acetate stencil and then we're gonna plop it on your skin. Um, so over the years, tattooing definitely has become more illustrative. Um, it's uh, really advanced um, in terms of technology. You can get more detail into a tattoo. Um, there are better needles, there are more groupings, um, and I can show you all those later on when I'll be tattooing this, uh, this clipper ship. Um, so basically in my process, I, uh, I start with a sketch. So it'll be like a rough sketch, you know, like if you're just drawing on, 
you know, like a piece of scrap paper and you need to move stuff around, um, you know, start with red pencil, kind of go from there. And then like after that, you refine it and you make it, you know, into like a full blown drawing. So what I'm going to be tattooing today, this guy. So basically clipper ship, very traditional, very new traditional, um, you know, hard line kind of thing. Um, and that's how we'll be doing that. Um, so like before there are stencils, like you would have this, this is what's applied to the skin to like, you know, get a tattoo onto the skin. So you put a layer of ointment down and then you pop it on and then your tattoo is on the leg. I'm doing that while I'm talking at the same time. Um, but before I used acetate stencils. So basically it was a piece of plastic that you would uh, heavily engrave and then you would press it into a sort of carbon like ink or um, you would like rub on it and then you would like apply that to the skin. So like throughout time that process has like developed too. Um, tattooing itself has been practiced for thousands of years. It's been around since Neolithic times. Um, I think the oldest discovered tattooed human skin dates back to about 3370 BC. And I think tattooing has been found as far as like Greenland, Alaska, Alaska, Siberia, Mongolia, Western China, Egypt, Sudan, and the Philippines. So it's been around for tens of thousands of years. Um, and it's been practiced everywhere, you know, whether people want to tell you that it's prevalent or not, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to. Um, tattooing in the United States basically had its prime and it, it was most popular during, I'd say the late 1800s into the 1970s. And it sort of went through like a weird up and down stage where a lot of states sort of made it illegal um, and then eventually figured people were tattooing underground anyway <laughs> and then decided to legalize it again. So places like New York City and the Bowery, they, uh, it was legal for quite a bit and then it became illegal in the 1970s and then made legal again in like 1997, I believe. Um, and people were tattooing underground. Um, anyway, you know, it's like not something that you could ever stop. It's like when you made alcohol illegal, then prohibition, people still drank alcohol. Um, so prevalent, like, tattooers, so uh, like Millie uh, from, from the Bowery, um, she had been uh, tattooing in the early 1900s, um, and she had her own shop down in uh, New York City. Let me get my notes here. Um, so she was tattooing up until 1960s herself um, when the Bowery in New York City was the mecca for tattooing. Uh, she was the only tattooer uh, proclaimed to be in part of New York City. Um, and until they made it like legal in New York City again and then legalized, uh, you know, people were tattooing out of their apartments. And um, one of my uh, favorite female tattooers presently in New York City uh, would be Michelle Miles from Daredevil Tattoo. She was one of those people who was actually tattooing out of her apartment, like during that time period, um, which is really cool. You know, it was it was very uh, it came from like a darker past. It became very seedy before it became like you know more regulated in that city and all that. Um, and even before that, too, uh, lady tattooers like, uh, like Artoria Gibbons, um, during the late 1800s, uh, she, um, she tattooed, but it was mostly her husband, um, and put she was also, like, a circus act, so she made her living tattooing and then doing circus act stuff, so... It's been a wild ride tattooing, um, which brings us to like sort of present day, I guess. Uh, it's more regulated, but it's um, it's still a little bit underground, which is I feel like why a lot of people like, like to do it.
Um, and that's sort of the brief history of like sort of lady tattooing, um, my tattooing, um, and a little bit of like whole history of tattooing. So I guess I could start actually tattooing if you guys would like. Sure. Is that a sign? Yeah. Good? <laughs> and I can also take questions and um, everything like while I'm tattooing too. So feel free to ask away. I see you, Mike G in the corner. <laughs> I'm gonna reposition my uh, my screen. You okay, Molly? Yep, good to go. Okay, so this is Molly. Hi. She's gonna be getting tattooed today. And then <laughs> Hi, Molly. Marie in the background also tattooing. I don't know if you can see her, but there they are. <laughs> uh, so I'm, uh, you know. This is like inception. We can see ourselves in two places now. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Does it work out or is there echo? No, that's good. Cool. If anybody else has an echo, just let me know. Um, and I'll kind of talk about the process of tattooing also um, while I'm doing it so you can guys can kind of, you know, get a feel for what it is. Um, it takes a lot of practice, you know, like to get from like this sketch to to this you know you just have to have a a really good ipad or you have to have like a really smooth hand um which is why tattooing like isn't quite for everyone i'm just adjusting this a little bit i think that's good so you can kind of see my face kind of see the tattoo I could use this box. Even better. There we go. Uh, so basically what I'm going to be lining with is I'm going to be using a nine man, or a, sorry, a nine shader. And I'm going to get my glasses on here too. <laughs> Freshly broke before I started this. <laughs> so basically what you do this is a tattoo machine so it's really fast there are nine tiny needles in this one grouping so it kind of holds it like a brush a lot of people have the misconception that it's one needle when it's really a series of many needles actually like hold the ink. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Let's see, what do I do? That machine is so quiet, none of us can actually hear it. That's amazing. That's, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, rotary machine versus a coil machine. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, machines back in the day were coil machines, which, which is driven by electromagnetic. Originally, it was designed to be, well, a doorbell for one. <laughs> and then it was also going to be a, a different kind of stencil pen that made the same sort of movement that this does, but for a different purpose. Someone decided to put a needle in it and then, you know, put some ink on that and jab themselves. <laughs> so it's super rudimentary, you know. Um, let's see if I can see. You start with a little puddle of ink and then really basically, the needle drives in that ink that's resting on the surface of the skin. So there's like, there's no magic, you know, it's not like injecting anyone, you know, syringe like with ink. I actually have a question. Do the needles differ um, when you're doing shading versus an outline, like the, the layout of them on the actual tool or? Yeah, like, so if I had a shading needle, um, if you're familiar with a filbert brush, 
Mm -hmm. it, uh, it has the same sort of like shape of that. It's a uh, like I tend to use a mag which has a sort of fanned out filbert brush sheet. And um, it can have 90 needles, it can have 13 needles, it can have like 30, like it's, it's crazy. You can line with a single needle, but you're going to get a really small line like that. Right, yeah. And do, um, the, do the, like if you have more needles, say on an outline, uh, head if you will um is that i i guess like in the healing process is the ink more likely to kind of fall out a little bit the thinner it is or i think so you know i think like retaining wise like um there are needles called bunk pin needles with the needle size itself is actually like very they're very very thin little needles um but they're there can be like oh, many of them. There can be like 13, like all in like a little packed area. Um, and they just hold a lot of ink in between like all those little tiny needles. So it's really easy to like inject the ink like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it's single lined with one needle, like it's basically like, if you think of it as like one individual poke over and over and over again, who well, this is like nine right. pokes at a time. Right, okay. So Molly's a champ here. Yeah, she's, she's just doing really good. Sitting really well. Yep. She's very heavily tattooed anyway, so she's kind of used to this, right? Oh, yeah. How, how wide is this, this uh, mark that you're making right now? <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess like if I were to estimate it in real time, like this mark is probably like a really fat nine or, or uh, eight micron. If you want about, how about, uh, what, what, is that like a like a sixteenth of an inch? <laughs> I guess roughly, right? I don't know. I'd have to go get my micron pens and. That's <laughs> <laughs> really related. It's this big. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Which looks so much bigger on the phone right now. Yeah, like I can't tell what size it is. Um, and ideally, when you're tattooing, you want to do one line. You want to do, like, you want to make that needle do the work one time and not go back into it. So if you like, go back in, oh, like go ahead. spray painting. Yeah, if you go back, well, I mean, kind of. Like, it'll look sloppier if you go back into it a second time um but in this case also it'll look sloppier and then it'll fall out if you go into it way too many times so you can really easily kind of destroy the skin you're working on if you're going into it more than like two or three times so ideally your 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 one your first mark is your mark and that you're trying to gauge your needles to match what the line thickness is for that particular section Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't do like a crazer's line variation in this a little bit, like on these leaves and like up here and things. Mm -hmm. But like this piece in general is just going to be like all lined uniformly. Now, when and you're then, wiping, when you're wiping across it, you know you're applying the ink and then you're wiping away. When you're doing that, is it removing the purple applique, or is that still there? It's like, it's mostly there. Um, the way that the stencil works is that it'll stay long enough for you to get through your tattoo, ideally. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can over wipe an area and you can lose your entire stencil. Um, especially if like someone's sweating a lot or if they're about to pass out. <laughs> when someone's about to pass out, they'll have like a, they'll get really pale for one and then they'll also sort of get this sort of like sweat sheen over them and like that really really messes with the tattoo <laughs> it really just like but then they're yeah, but then they're but then they're, they're a lot quieter and stiller right <laughs> oh my god yeah, totally. That's totally how that works. <laughs> then you can do whatever um, you want <laughs> yeah 
Well, so what really happens, you know, like people are like, oh yeah, I'm passed out, I'll be sleeping. Like you, you <laughs> shit yourself <laughs> and you piss yourself <laughs> and you vomit on yourself. So oh. like no, you basically excrete <laughs> from all of your orifices. <laughs> That's what this will this will uh, make great you YouTube content for the gallery, yeah. Jamie. I'm so You're proud. <laughs> welcome. Like I said, tattooing is a dirty business. That's um, good. So I have a question about um, colors because, um, as you know, I'm I'm tattooed not quite as heavily as Molly, but um, a little bit, right? And, you, have uh, a, you have a half sleeve. You have, yeah, you have half I, I'm, get, I'm getting to the heavy side now. Right. Um, so in terms of colors, uh, I tend to find that personally on my skin, oranges and yellows have a hard time staying. I don't know if that's t a typical experience um, or if it's just me. Uh, do you find that some colors have more lasting power more than longevity. others? More longevity, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Essentially, like, tattoo ink is made out of metal salt, metal salt and clays. Um, and some ink is definitely more reactive than others. Mm -hmm. So, like, like reds. Um, if anyone's gonna have a problem with the ink, it's gonna be a red, or it's gonna be an orange, or it's gonna be a yellow. Your body doesn't know how to react to it as well. Okay. So sometimes, like I've had clients, will it will just flip out the ink entirely. Um, I've had others where it, it just fades. You know, if it's a lighter color, it'll fade like a lot faster than, um, you know, like black wood. Like my philosophy in tattooing is things need black outline. You know, they need that sort of uh, whatever color is in there. If you did a yellow rose, you're gonna want to have a black outline around that yellow rose. So right. you can tell what it is in 20 years when that yellow fades out and then you can recolor it. Yeah, I've gotten my yellow rose on my back recolored about two times, so. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just guessing, I didn't know you actually had a no, yellow rose. No, I actually have a yellow <laughs> rose. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, what, that's just what happens naturally. Yellow is definitely the worst to fade out besides white. Like white will fade out pretty bad too, but um, yeah, yellow is definitely one of those. So let's see. My friend Lux has a question in the chat. He says, uh, or they say, uh, watching a live tattoo session over Zoom is an interesting experience. Due to recent times, I've had a lot of extra time to rethink what I'd like to do for my first tattoo. What seems to change pretty often is the location of the tattoo. For a first tattoo, are there any recommended areas of the body and no man's lands to know about? <laughs> that's a really, that's a really fun question. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I, it's going to hurt and it's going to be weird no matter where you get it. Uh, for me, like since I've been tattooed pretty much anywhere, I feel like it's hard to answer. Uh -huh. Um, I feel like a good, a good tester tattoo tends to be like middle of the arm or like ankle. Um, you know, those are the ones that you kind of like get a feeling of how a tattoo feels. Uh, getting a bigger tattoo versus like a smaller tattoo is also very different. I always um, kind of equate to getting like a large piece that's going to take six hours plus to like running a marathon versus like if you're getting a 15 minute tattoo that it barely hurts at all, you know, you, you barely experience what it is to actually get like a full-blown piece of work like this. So just a, an FYI, everyone, we do have thunderstorms in our area. Jamie's in the same neighborhood as me, so if I, I probably won't lose power, but I'm just making a disclaimer in case uh, my Wi-Fi goes out. But... I guess that would really suck if the power went out. <laughs> yeah, that would be awful. <laughs> Um, it's raining pretty heavily outside. I think it's, I think it'll be fine, but I would, I just want to acknowledge oh, no. that there's rain outside and right. some thunder, so. Yeah. So would you recommend, Jamie, for, for someone who's getting tattoos, I mean, my, my, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a tattoo free person, but, uh, from the folks that I know who have tattoos like yourself, um, most of them usually say is like any place where there's sort of a low skin to bone ratio. 
So the thicker the area, the, the less sensitive because you're sort of tapping against a thinner region. If you're going up against thin bone, like the back of your hand or your shins or, uh, you know, thin spaces, would that be so the it, case? It, um, I think that's like partially true, but it's partially a myth. Um, what seems to be more the case is like whatever, there tends to be more nerve endings and you happen to have more nerve endings and joints where you're, you know, your bones sort of stick out a little bit. Um, so knees and ankles and feet really hurt. Like those awful. are, those, those are, are awful. awful. <laughs> Molly's saying you're yeah. awful. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, can, uh, I can attest to this. I have both of my Achilles tendons tattooed. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I have like ink. The ink has fallen out a little bit on them, and I actually have decided not to touch them up. I'm all set. That's fine. That's I fine. I am all set. <laughs> well, that's all another set. thing too. Um, tattoos age. You yes. know, tattoos age over time, and like they're gonna turn into something. You know, they might still retain mostly what they used to be or they might um turn into a blob and like i i find that like in tattooing um you know you can get it touched up or you can just let it age with you like that's my philosophy like i kind of got a lot of my tattoos at a certain time period and um you know like they're going to change but you change too so it's uh you kind of grow together part of your story, right? It is, it is part of your story. Yep. Uh, James has a question. Yes, James. Uh, he's curious how many sessions roughly it will take to complete this tattoo. Um, if we were being brave, we could probably do it in one session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're not being brave today. <laughs> uh, this is going to be two sessions. So we'll complete all the line work tonight. And then we'll um, do the fading at like a, a different time. It takes about two weeks for tattoos to heal. So um, I usually give it about three weeks just in case someone's a slow healer. Like if someone has diabetes, they tend to heal a little bit slower, especially if they're getting tattooed in their extremities. Um, so yeah, this will, we could do it tonight, but we're not gonna. I think the longest I've had two is probably about six hours. Um, but you know, that's a long time. And then going back to how testing is also illustration, like when you're looking at a drawing for too long, you go blind sometimes. So you can't necessarily right. see like what you would, uh, you know, what you would do differently or what you would need to do or anything like that. So, um, it's good to kind of step away from your tattoo a little bit and, uh, you know, kind of get like a new view. So like a lot of times I'll take like a break in between and, um, you know, sort of look at it from afar. Maybe I'll take a photo of my, on my phone because it looks, for whatever reason, when you take a photo of your phone, on your phone of a art piece, like it looks differently on the phone than it does in person. Well, sure, the Mona Lisa looks different in person as it does on the internet. On the internet, it's great. Uh, in real life, it's semi-disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think it's really small. It's, it is really small. It, it's, very, it's very small. Um, yeah. Yeah, but most tattoos are not disappointing in real life. That was a really bad I mean, analogy. I've seen, I've seen some things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, I guess when choosing your tattoo artist, too, like, that's a, another good point is like when you look at a portfolio um, for any tattoos like you want to make sure that they have like a good portfolio of art um, you know and they have like a, a solid tattoo portfolio so right you don't have a disappointing tattoo like after your all time right <laughs> who, yep. wants, who wants that who wants sadness inside you know um Okay, we have another comment and or question. Let me read it. Uh, I'm sure, oh, sorry, the chat's going crazy. All right, I'm sure this may have already been asked. Sorry for arriving late. No problem, first of all, no problem. Uh, with the state of the current health climate, has there been many difficulties in doing such a close and intimate thing with customers in your tattoo artistry? Are you confident that someone like me should go and get a tattoo this summer? 
How are things changing in the industry to address these fears? Um, so like the tattoo industry, for the most part, especially like in upstate New York, is kind of self-regulated. Mm -hmm. So um, with my experience of how there's been regulation here, like um, everyone seems to be like sort of self-implementing like the policies that have been suggested. Um, and that's kind of across the board with all industries, um, but like no one's really enforcing it. So when you go into a tattoo place, uh, to get a tattoo, if you come to Three of Swords, um, you know, we're going to ask for your temperature. You're going to have to fill out a form saying that you don't have COVID, that you've never been, um, or you haven't been in contact with someone who's personally had it for a prolonged period of time. Um, so it's a new series of questionnaires. We're all wearing masks. Um, that helps a lot. Wearing masks is a good thing. Don't let anyone tell you different with that. Uh, so you, you try to be as safe as possible. Um, we all have cross-contamination and bloodborne pathogen um, certificates anyway. So, you know, a good tattooer will be trained in that regardless of like the situation or not. So you want to make sure that like all masks, certificates, you know, policies, uh, temperature checking, like when you go into a tattoo place, like that's, that's what to look out for. If you go in and like, you know, no one's wearing a mask and there's nothing different than there ever was, then you might be in a dangerous situation. James has another question. Um, that is really interesting, the factors that affect how long it takes to complete a tattoo. I also wanted to ask if there's significance of the phrase quiet storm. Uh, so that would be for Molly. All right, Molly. <laughs> yeah, quiet storm for me is just kind of like the internal stuff that you go through that you can't talk about. You know, you don't tell other people about it. It's kind of, you know, this internal storm that you just kind of weather and deal with. And you, know, you can't look to other people to help you get through it. You just kind of have to do it yourself. Yep. I feel that. Yeah. <laughs> And tattooing is so personal too. I mean, not everyone's tattoos are conceptual. Uh, like we were just talking about this before we, uh, you know, went and invited everybody into the room, but uh, you get so tattooed to a point where you kind of don't care where you place it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> or, you, or you just want something nice looking. It's not necessarily conceptual. Um, I mean, Jamie, do you have a... Um, like a, a type of tattoo that you prefer to do or a theme that you really like or um, I guess that's more your niche? Neo traditional and traditional. Um, so traditional tattooing basically relies on a lot of classic designs. So like this clipper ship I'm tattooing, this would be like considered a traditional tattoo. So it's like it's thick bold lines and then very solid coloring on the inside and when you see a new traditional it's those concepts but paired with a little bit more illustrative um you know like it's not so formulaic there's a little bit more like abstract like thinking in it you can like take a what you would call a cabbage rose and then turn it into like a slightly more like realistic rose but like it's still not quite realistic uh -huh. um so I'd say like I definitely veer toward that. And then any tattooer that you go to, like they're going to specialize ideally in a specific style. You know, like it's one of those things like jack of all trades, master of none. So um, if you're looking for a traditional tattooing, go to a traditional tattooist. If you're looking for like realism or black and gray, you want to go to someone who specializes in that also. Mm -hmm. um like it's like the same thing as like you wouldn't go to a foot doctor if you need brain surgery um you know you want to go to the person who's going to cater to what you want more in the one style with especially that. portraits yeah especially portraits <laughs> portraits can get really messed up really yes easily. i believe we've all seen those on reddit have we not okay oh, yeah. yes 
Um, well, here's a funny story. It's one of my, I, I'm really good at self-deprecating stories because I feel like, you know, you have to make fun of like. Yeah. So about uh, 10 years ago, um, I wanted to do realism tattooing and I'm good in, with realism on paper, but I'm not necessarily good with realism on a tattoo. So my buddy at the time, he uh, loved Neil Patrick Harris, loved him. And we're like, we're going to do this beautiful Neil Patrick Harris tattoo on this foot. <laughs> oh no. Gross, stinky foot. Um, so we did, and he couldn't take it. Like, mm. it was like, we half finished it. We took a photo of it because we thought it was funny. I thought it was an okay portrait. I was so wrong. <laughs> So this photo of this tattoo of Neil Patrick Harris ends up going on to Twitter. And oh no, oh no. Neil, pa Neil Patrick Harris, <laughs> everyone's covering their faces. Neil Patrick Harris ends up retweeting this tattoo. And from that, Neil Patrick Harris, about a week later, is on Conan O'Brien. <laughs> Conan O'Brien and Andy Richter put this crappy Neil Patrick Harris <laughs> On national TV. <laughs> so Andy Richter and Conan O'Brien and Neil Patrick Harris made fun of my portrait tattoo on national TV. Oh I never, my god. I never did a portrait tattoo ever again. And that's a real fucking story. You can find the clip on YouTube. Maybe I'll post it later. <laughs> everyone, everyone, we will be featuring um, the Neil Patrick Harris portrait on the Point of Contact Facebook page. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> of all the tattoos I ever do, like, you know, the, the weird, stupid ones go viral. And like, they yeah. end up like, you know, whatever. It's my life. Who cares? <laughs> um, I was wondering, Jamie, this is, hi, Mary. Uh, Hi. Jamie, what, have you ever been in the position where someone came in with a tattoo image that you just thought was hateful or wrong, or did you ever try to encourage people not to do what maybe they want to do for yeah. whatever reason, ethical, political? That's a great question. Um, absolutely. You know, like when it comes to like, you know, Democrat versus Republican, that's like, you know, that's a whatever choice, uh, whoever chooses to do that. But like, if it, if it comes down to like, someone wants a swastika, and they're not getting it because they're Hindu. Right. Um, you know, they're getting it because they hate a whole group of whole series of people, then I will definitely turn that down. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's not a good choice. But like, as far as being ethical too, um, like for non-political reasons, like if someone comes in and they want the name of like a lover, mm -hmm. they want the name of like someone that they haven't like known for a very long time, um, I'll be like, well, maybe you want to rethink this, you know, like maybe like this is not, <laughs> not a good choice. That's so responsible. I love that. Well, you know, half the time those people come back wanting cover-ups of this name. So it is job security for me, but it's like heartbreak for them. Um, Lux says, okay, now I would like to know some of the stories of the bazaar from your hidden portfolio. Oh, God. Um, well, to keep in all professionalism, I can't say some of those. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> But, like, there's definitely some characters, like, in tattooing. I feel a lot of what draws someone to being a tattooer is being wanting to be outside the norm. Um, they want to be outside society a little bit. It used to be a lot more niche back in the day. Um, it's definitely more mainstream since all the tattoo shows, like Ink Master and all that. But, um... Yeah, you know, like you, you put a whole bunch of artists into one room and like give them a machine that like draws like cool designs on people, then like you get all types of craziness that happens. Um, so I wish I could give you a better story right now, but you know, if you look at any type of uh, like tattoo history, like Chuck Eldridge um, from the Tattoo Archive, he is a plethora of like old school tattoo history or Bowery scan, um, any of those old guys who tattooed like way back, they have the best stories.
they would touch sure you. Sure they like, do. Oh yeah. Like they were touching all types of people, um, sailors, prostitutes, you know, like for for that period of time, tattooing was so underground, so um, that's what it was equated with. Circus freak, circus uh, side show stuff, like that was, that was um, a big industry like way back in the day. So question for you, Jamie. Um, yeah. Do you run into like old school dudes who come in who maybe had their tattoos done in the 70s and 60s and they're like, hey, I want to get a new tattoo. And yeah. do they, is there, I mean, do they, do they go, wow, that was way better and this looks way better um, than when I had it done. You know, the technology's come a long way and, you know, we were, we were, you know, trying to get wasted so that we could take the tattooing versus now, which they're like, wow, that was really good. Right. Did you get any kind of response or have you had that experience? Um, what's a little, okay, so first of all, I love seeing tattoos from like the 1970s. It's like a mark of history, you know, like that period of tattooing is, um, it has like its own sort of scenario behind it. Um, I mean, absolutely the quality has gone up, so, um, you know, like what you would see then versus now is different. Uh, they really don't know what to expect. A lot of those dudes are kind of like off the rocker by now too, so they don't really know what's going on half the time, but they're very thankful to be touched by like a lady tattoo or with gentle hands. Aww. That's, that's the general response I get from older 1970s like men getting tattooed. I always notice I've got friends who are older who have their tattoos and I look at them and I go, man, you could use a touch up or like, <laughs> I, I can barely yeah. tell that that like that lady on your arm is looking pretty rough. You know? <laughs> well, again, that's, like, that's part of things. the magic. Oh yeah, they, they've seen a lot of things. Um, if you ever want to look at a good documentary about old school, like that era tattooing, Stoney Knows How has a series of videos. He was a circus performer, so he um he was disabled, so he's he's a midget, you know, he's a very small man and he had these little arms he tried to like tattoo with. Um, but like he had yeah, he had some cool stories. Those tattoos like didn't come out great, but like you weren't getting tattooed for like the quality of it. You're getting tattooed to like be with Stony, you know. You're ta <laughs> getting tattooed for the experience. A lot of times, like, that's what tattooing is, too. It's um, getting tattooed for the experience rather than the aesthetic value. Like, some of my most fun personal tattoos that I have have been getting tattooed by, like, friends and colleagues, like, around me or, um, you know, tattooing each other or tattooing yourself. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a whole sort of like different experience. It's almost like a different way of living your life. But each tattooer kind of um, has a similar story. So like one of my favorite tattooers, uh, Randy Randerson, he has a tattoo blog he calls Monday Malarkey. And like all the stories that he posts about his apprenticeship or like working as a tattooer, um, you know, like you like to read it and like, oh, yeah, I was sweating bullets as like an apprentice, like trying to put like a fine line tattoo on someone who's jittery as hell. You know, like it's a, it's like a universal thing. I think I over answered your question. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. It gave a thumbs up, so. Nice. Um, okay, so James has another question. Uh, have you done any tattoos based on the work of H.R. Geiger? Geiger? H.R. Geiger. There we go. Um, or his style of biomechanics. I'm so sorry. I'm not familiar with that person. So, uh, yeah, biomechanical tattooing was a prevalent style, I think, mostly into the 90s. Um, it was really popular back then. I remember seeing the movie Alien and I'm like, oh my god, that would make a cool tattoo. So artists like Paul Booth and Guy Atkinson, like those guys, um, those guys really pioneered the sort of biomechanical style. Uh, 
you know, like maybe like newer tattooers aren't super familiar with them. Maybe you are, but like, um, yeah, Booth tattooed Geiger spot on. You know, he had all the biomechanical workings, um, black and gray for his time period. Like he was, he was on point. My myself personally, like I, I was definitely I did a couple of those tattoos, but like. I never thought it was my niche, you know, I was never a black and gray artist, um, you know, I like macabre stuff, but like Paul Booth and like, you know, those dudes, those, they really pioneered doing that kind of work. Um, Lux has another question. James and Lux are keeping the chat alive tonight, I appreciate yeah. it. Um, nice. To the future jittery customers, what would you recommend to individuals who must have a tattoo but struggle with the process of being under the needle? Um, I would say practice yoga before. <laughs> that's nice. Like really, yeah, I mean, it's, um, that's my strategy. Uh, like yoga is about breathing through a difficult pose. Um, so like, as well as getting stabbed thousands of times a minute, um, you know, you're also sitting in one position, so you have to like, kind of self-regulate your own pain. You have to just breathe through it and like not fight it, you just sort of accept it. So there's, um, I think for me and maybe like a lot of people, there's definitely like a meditative like process for it. you know, or just chill out. Like, that's cool, too. <laughs> yeah. I know sometimes for me personally, I've had some relatively painful tattoos, some not so painful as well. But um, when I get to the really painful parts, I can't talk. Um, and I almost go into a meditative state. Um, and I have to focus on just that and only that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I would say that's very good advice, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, like, if you go into it thinking that it's not going to hurt or you're overreacting that it is going to hurt, like, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. You know, like, you just you can't, it's a needle in your skin, so you have to have realistic expectations that it's going to um, not feel fantastic. Yeah. And granted, some spots are easier than others, you know. It's true. Um, you know, I've, I have my half sleeve, the inner part of my arm is there's a lot of thin skin there so um places like that tend to be a little bit more difficult oh well, absolutely um, and they tend yeah. to um they tend to blow out a bit too um yeah. they tend to like be so thin skin and so tender that like if you go too deep with the needle that it'll just fall out or fall right. into the um the fatty layer of skin it doesn't need to be yeah, and, and blowout, I've had blowout before, um, and it, it can be fixed with a little extra coverage, but that's also part of um, picking a more skilled tattoo artist, because the ta if the tattoo artist is more skilled, the less likely you are to get blowout, in my, in yeah. my opinion, in my experience. Yeah, yeah, it, it can happen. I mean, in large-scale stuff, like, um, it will happen more often because you're hitting all those little dinky parts like uh so like if you're working in a stomach that has a lot of stretch marks and like even with mm -hmm. skill you can still inadvertently go a little bit too deep on parts like that mm -hmm. um, but you plan for that or you warn against it or you just don't tattoo it because skin is so fragile that you just don't want to tattoo into it because it's just going to be one giant blowout but definitely the skill um experience help um you know you don't want to start learning tattooing by tattooing like <laughs> someone who has a lot of stretch marks like all over the place right you're just, like, yeah you up for failure. it's a little more challenging it's a lot more challenging yeah molly how you feeling we're checking in with you oh i'm great good Good. Yeah, we're about, uh, I want to say three quarters the way through the outline. So, pretty fast tattooer sometimes. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, this is going to take way more than an hour. We're approaching not even an hour yet. So, I'm impressed. Yeah, I mean, the entire tattoo would definitely take longer. Oh, of course, of course. 
Do you have any uh, colors in mind for this one specifically yet or? Um, so like with any tattoo, you want to do like a contrast of uh, color, but sometimes you can also do texture. Mm -hmm. So for the roses, we're going to keep those like kind of like, I think like traditional red and like green leaves. And then the interior of the bottle, I'm going to do some stippling dot work. So it's going to be, um, you know, mostly could be black work with a little bit of like dot texture in it. So unfortunately, I don't think I'll get to that point tonight, but it'll look cool when I post it later. <laughs> so you just opened your business recently, correct? When was your um, opening date? So I opened Three of Swords uh, last year on August 13th. So we, though I've been tattooing the area for a long time, like I've been open here for about a year, uh, minus the time we had to be closed because of COVID. Right. What a time to open a business, right? <laughs> what what a cool time in the world. What a cool time in the world. Um, well, the cool thing about like tattooing though is even though it is a weird time in the world right now, um, historically like down like the there was a renaissance of tattooing back like I want to say eighteen ninety to like nineteen fifty or forties like so before like World War One, like tattooing was doing really well and that was still the Great Depression. There's something weird about tattooing that people still want it even though there's like some sort of economic sort of down, down right. results. Just like lipstick, um, that's like a classic example of like industries that do well and like economic hardship. Um, you know, there's something to tattooing that like people want it and need it they crave it it's definitely a sort of adrenaline rush when you're getting a tattoo it's aesthetically pleasing it's kind of like getting your hair done permanently you know you can kind of make a change to yourself you know when you can't change the world around you at least you can change your own skin right it's a it's a form of self-control you feel in control right yeah. yeah yeah and it's like lipstick is the same thing it's like well i feel like shit today because i can't buy a milk but at least i can buy this lipstick and look great you know right <laughs> so it's a it's, it's a weird mental thing so i'm i'm hoping for that you know i'm definitely worried about the future like everyone else but um, sure you know if i don't have free swords i'll be touching underground so james has another question are modest size tattoos of the i'm so sorry if i butcher this word orobos or oroboros symbol a oh, Ouroboros? yeah i was like wait hold on i i have not read this word out loud ever yeah. uh symbol a popular request what has been your experience drawing them if any are occult themed tattoos increasingly prevalent among your clients or are how they now are they now an industry standard um, I think that mysticism definitely had its a uh, its little peak going right now. Um, yeah, a lot of lunar stuff. Um, I'm into it. I I'm very science minded. Um, I like the history behind symbols, and I like um, you know, I like how they look. Uh, so like for me, that's my my. Studio is named after the Three of Swords, which is a tarot card. Um, it's symbolic, um, and I feel like occult stuff has a lot of symbolism to a lot of people, especially when they're looking for direction. So even though I don't necessarily believe in any sort of magic or supernatural, that um, those symbols are very important, and they'll help you sort of guide your own way in a you know, in a psychology sort of sense. I haven't tattooed the Ouroboros itself in a, a little bit, but, um, you know, once you kind of talk about it, I'm sure someone will like be like, oh yeah, that, that, that sounds cool. Look at that tattoo. Hopefully that answers your question. This is kind of mesmerizing. I feel like I could just hang, like, I can see why you can do this for so long. It's, it's very entrancing. 
I mean, even though Molly might not be feeling great, oh, I'm, I'm she's fine, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's meditative for me to talk to. Um, you know, like, it, it's a focus point, but art, like, outside of tattooing is also like that for me. So, um, you know, I, I can focus on this one thing and sort of, like, blank out whatever noise because I have to. You know, when you're tattooing, you're focusing on like so many things all at once. Like if you let in any background noise, you're definitely altering your own process. I feel like the same goes for painting. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. I just want to comment very quickly that Mike Genitasio has uh, been playing around with uh, with his backgrounds and we're recording this artist talk and he is like actually <laughs> the first people on my screen during the recording so all of you two will appreciate your aesthetic Mike. Thanks. No, thanks Mike T. You're, you're welcome. I was showing my I was showing my roommate he's over here watching as well so. Oh okay. Is it we're, hello? We're enjoying it. Hi. Hello, yes, boss. <laughs> Hi. Boss, what about Coco Puff though? Uh, he died, I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> you tell him, boss. Tell him. Tell him. Oh, tell him what happened. Tell him what happened, though. They got another one. Oh, did they? <laughs> if you guys don't know, Coco Puff is a giant rabbit that uh, my roommate, boss, was obsessed with the first time I met him. And all he could talk about was this, like, giant, beautiful bunny. And it was adorable. <laughs> I don't know how cool it is to be a 40-year-old man filmmaker to follow a giant rabbit, but... <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm okay. It's COVID period, so I'm okay. Yeah. Anything goes, man. Yeah. It's, a, it's a brave new world. <laughs> so um, with that, I'm going to actually say, does anyone have any further questions? Because this tattoo might take a lot longer than we have time for with Jamie, but um, does anybody have any questions before? Oh, hold on. James. What's your opinion on glow-in-the-dark tattoos? Oh, this is actually a great question. It's something I didn't know existed until recently. Yeah, so from my research of what I've done uh, with glow-in-the-dark tattoos, like in the past, um, apparently the pigment in glow-in-the-dark tattoos was made from the adhesive that they would use in hip implants. Um, and when they were curing hip implants, they happened to use an ultraviolet light and it, it glowed. Um, so they started putting that pigment into tattoo ink still so, like the problem with that is like sometimes hip replacements also reject um not all the time but sometimes so when you're tattooing with uv ink um typically it's okay but sometimes you get that client where you use uv ink and then they itch forever um so for that reason itself like i don't use it i have in the past and it looks really cool but uh, due to its unpredictable nature, like I tend to avoid it. But it looks awesome. Cool. Yeah. That's not something I ever have thought that I wanted on myself, but they are very new. They are very yeah, new. Yeah, it was, um, so like back in the early 2000s, there were a couple companies that said they were FDA approved to have these uh, UV reactive inks. And like, that was just a lie. Ooh. <laughs> that was just a straight up lie. Big so yikes. Them. Those companies don't exist anymore, as far as I know. Of course but, not. They, um, <laughs> but you can still find UV ink like um, through different suppliers if you really want to. Um, you know, it its longevity um, isn't fantastic either. Like it'll glow for a little bit, you know, like maybe five years, and like after a while, it has to be reapplied because your body's absorbed it. Um, and your body will absorb some tattoo ink when you're getting it too. It'll go through your lymph nodes and your lymphatic system and your kidneys and all that. Um, so even though it gets deposited in the third or fourth layer, um, it also uh, it also gets stuck in your lymph nodes a little bit, especially if you've had uh, tattoo removal. Uh, it doesn't disappear. It just sort of gets absorbed and flushed through your system. Got it. Yeah, I actually have a question. This is my last question um because i've seen this a few times and i think we've had a previous discussion about this but i would like to open the forum um i've noticed that people have started tattooing their eyeballs like the oh. whites of their eyes yes yeah and that is an extremely controversial tattoo <laughs> um if you it's not, it's 
not a good idea. Yeah, no, um, people have gone I blind. Like I think, and like, it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Yeah, no, yeah, eyeball, no, no. It's, um, because it's technically not even tattooing. You're using like a little syringe to inject um, ink in between the layers of eyeball. So like if you go too deep, you do it wrong, you use the wrong ink, like you go blind. Um, that doesn't really sound like a, you know, a risk that anyone should take. Um, you can do it correctly, but since it's such a new type of tattooing, like, you know, over the course of like 50 years, like, do, will the ink migrate deeper into your eyeball and uh, connect with your optic nerve and then, you know, you go blind from that. Um, there's other sort of like, you know, underground body modification things that you can find online, you know, and it, they all look cool. Um, but they all come with like high risk situations or high risk healing. Um, essentially, some people are using people with guinea pigs um, to see what happens. And like that's, it can be abusive even though it's consensual. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, it, it's about consent. So like if you want to do it, you should definitely go into it knowing full risk and like the person doing it should also tell you the risk and not try to convince you of doing it at all. Right. Just don't do it. <laughs> just, just don't do it. It's a bad it's a decision. Bad it's, it's a bad, bad choice. choice. Um, so last, um, this is gonna be our last question yeah. from James because I think it's a great question to end on actually. Um, okay. A related question to glow in the dark tattoo. What do you think is the future of tattoo as far as new technology? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, I have seen, there's always new tattoo machines being invented. Um, so the one thing that I've seen that might be weird, it's like an automatic, ta automatic tattoo. So it's like, it works like a like laser printer, you know, it sort of goes over the area and it, uh, it has a pre-calculated design. So if they perfect that, then that could be a thing, but I think it's really far into the future. Like I've watched this machine work and it just kind of goes over um, the tattoo like line by line, but it doesn't account for all of the little things that you have to think about when you're tattooing someone's skin either. So like none of those tattoos uh come out great um i mean technology always improves and it's always innovative so i can see there being some crazy japanese machine in the future where you just stick your arm like into this device and you receive a tattoo like in the movies that would be and that's crazy weird. yeah that is weird but it <laughs> weirder things have happened right <laughs> yeah I, I see that like 20 or 50 years in the future but you know yeah. it's the technology is not not there yet. Uh, no. There, no. There is a great. There's a great video mm -hmm. for uh, um, a robotic arm that does tattoos that they're oh, developing, and yeah. it and it's it's pretty crazy because they almost have to lock him into a position in order to calibrate where it's supposed to hit. And, yeah. Uh, the guy has a whole series of tattoos across his body of mm -hmm. these test patterns for the robot that it's like kind of insane. <laughs> Does it look wow. better as it goes on? You know, does it like, does it look like the robot's improving? It does. It does. It <laughs> definitely looks, one looks better than the other as they Burn go. Burn it on. with fire. <laughs> <laughs> the, the robot needs an apprenticeship too. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. Oh hey. <laughs> Okay, guys. Well, I'm gonna okay. say thank you to Jamie. Thank you for this amazing talk and discussion. I think everybody had a lot of wonderful questions and input. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, if you're interested in staying up to date with current exhibitions and programs at Point of Contact, please sign up for our mailing list on our website and Sheridan, who's over here for me. Um, she's gonna put it in the chat right now. Um, and a quick note for those of you interested um, when we will be able to see each other again in person. Uh, socially distanced, of course. Uh, point of contact will be reopening on September 7th by appointment only with our fall 2020 exhibition, Rewriting History. 
from Fabiola Jean-Louis. Uh, while it's absolutely not in our nature to have our doors closed, we do so for not only our safety, but for your safety. Uh, that does not mean we don't want you to visit us. Uh, so please send us an email. I want to see everybody there. Um, we're extremely responsive and we look forward to hosting you again in our space come September. So thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everyone. And a quick note, last one, join us next week for Mary Stanley, who's in our group here. She's going to be doing our next artist talk of the series, same time, same place on Zoom. You can find the information on our website, puntopoint.org, in the chat. Um, but thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Be well. Wear your masks. <laughs> okay. Nice, nice, nice t-shirt, Sarah. Thank you. I wore it just for tonight. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Sorry for fidgeting. I, I think I got it. Oh, you're good. Oh, you're good. You're good. You're good. I got in here and I got it. <laughs> That's okay. All right, everybody, have a good evening. Thank you.